Joseph Alvey is a uh, combat veter veteran of both the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. He served over 13 years in the United States Army, both in reserve and in active duty. He was an infantry infantryman who fought in the Battle of Fallujah. He was awarded the Bronze Star twice for both valor and meritorious service. He's also distinguished himself as a drill sergeant uh, in the Army Reserve. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in History from OSU. He's currently pursuing a CPA. Uh, he's been personally featured in Rolling Stone magazine as well as the novel House to House, an epic memoir of war for his unit's role in major combat operations. Uh, we just finished up talking, or we, we are talking about uh, conflict here today, and so um, Mr. Alvey is gonna step in here and talk a little bit about uh, his, his experience with that and maybe some of the, uh, some of the ways that uh, conflict is changing and some of the things that are coming up with that. So uh, take notes, pay attention, and hopefully we'll have a good conversation, ask some good questions at the end, and uh, there's probably gonna be a test question off this too, so, so pay attention. Uh, with that, Mr. Alvey, you're up. Yeah, that, that bio makes me sound a lot more high speed than I really am. But um, I'd like to first start off uh, thanking Brett and, and Seth for having me here in Fort Hayes University. Uh, this is a this is a pleasure to be here uh, to speak to uh, college students about about the military or anything, any kind of insight about the uh, transformation of the military. And hopefully, hopefully, I'll provide something. Um, something of merit to, to this discussion. Uh, I, I am, in the end, I, I'm not uh, part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or anything like that. I, I was, you know, I, I'm just a Staff Sergeant. This is pretty much the view of the Army and the transformation as pretty much from, from a certain level of scopes view. And, I, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. But uh, a title here, Drones, Insurgents, and GI Christie. All right, so here, here I am. I'm not gonna, this isn't gonna be too much of a, a picture-oriented PowerPoint. I probably should have, but uh, man, the older I get, the worse I get at PowerPoint. I should should be better, but you know. Um, but here I am. This is this is probably about 2001. Um, you know, I have I have a whopping two ribbons on my uh, chest there. Uh, that's my older brother right behind me, and that's my father right there. We have quite a bit of a military tradition in my family. My uh, that's my original father was a special forces pilot, and unfortunately, he crashed when I was in 1983. I was just a, a wee one, so. I never really got to meet him very much, but my mom, uh, obviously, she has good taste in military men, so she found my stepdad there, who's pretty much raised me since I was a, since I was a kiddo. Uh, he's a pretty high-speed, hard-charging guy. He was in Ranger Battalion. He's a pathfinder. And uh, during the Desert Storm, he, he found his way over there. He served his country. He was the first one of us in the family to go over there. Uh, I was still in first grade, so I, I didn't get my chance. Uh, I had to wait a couple more years later. Uh, my older brother, he joined the Army before I did. Uh, we both have sort of a similar background. We both went to, uh, I went to Oklahoma State University back in 1999. Uh, me and OSU kind of came to an agreement that maybe college wasn't right for me at that moment. Uh, they were more in that agreement than I was necessarily. But uh, so I was originally had a ROTC scholarship there. So I'd always planned on going into the military. Uh, I wanted to become an officer. But, you know, as I later learned, uh, the best officers always start off as enlisted men first because you got to know how it is, right? That's what we tell ourselves to make ourselves uh, sound better though so helps me sleep at night but uh so so there i, I played uh you know after after my failed experience with uh, college uh, my older brother joined the army before me he joined as an infantryman um and you know I, I had scored rather high on the asvab so when you know when it was my time when i was done you know kind of finding my place in a in the grand town of enid oklahoma i thought hey i'll go to this recruiter guy and i'll, I'll do my thing took the asvab scored well he's like hey you should be this uh, military intelligence. This is a job for you. You're, you sound like a pretty smart guy. You scored high. You know, you were in college, obviously. You know, you have a little bit of brains to you. Here's the job for you. It's yours for the taking. I said, no, I want to be airborne infantry. Like, come on, guy. You don't want to do that. You scored way too high. But no, airborne infantry. Let me, let me have at it. I said, all right. So uh, there I was. Next thing I know, shipping off to Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, home of the infantry. Uh, and, and then uh, they changed my life, kind of kind of made me a man a little bit, and, uh, you know, ended up in the army but and I'll get to my first duty station that that pretty little maroon beret I'm not allowed to wear anymore but very proud of that one but my older brother he was stationed he's also an infantryman and um, we have kind of this competition kind of an informal competition going for our military careers I ended up I'm four years younger than him I ended up going to Afghanistan before he had his chance to go uh, play war and I don't think he was very happy about that and so uh, that was in 2002 I in 2001, when 9-11 hit, I'd, I'd only been in the Army for nine months. 
Uh, I'd really, I would love to say I, I was one of the great patriots who joined after 9-11. No, I was just, you know, I, I loved my country and all, but I, I wanted stable work. You know, I wanted, I wanted a paycheck and I wanted, you know, um, some college money because I planned on going back again. Uh, which my hat's off always to the guys who joined after 9-11 because there was, there was no war going on. We were still kicking around, uh, hanging out, you know, back at this time. But So I, I end up, 9-11 uh, occurs. I remember the day it happened. Uh, we were out doing some pretty, pretty important training, stuff that never gets canceled. And uh, here we were uh, heading back to the barracks, loading up our bags and getting ready to jump into Afghanistan, right? Um, as young and dumb as, as we were, all 19, 20 year old kids, we were all excited about this. It takes, uh, it's really after wars when you realize that you shouldn't be so excited about that kind of stuff because it's kind of a serious issue. But hey, when you're, when you're 19, 18, you know, you're really, you know, you're ripping ready to fight, you know, and we were. And that's how the army wants us, right? That's how your army should be. But uh, so I, I went off to Afghanistan in 2002. We were delayed a little bit. I guess we weren't cool enough to go in the first wave. So we, could, we went to the second wave. And um, yeah, it, it, was, it was quite an adventure. It was, um, it's like Afghanistan for me was like, uh, and I, I'm, a, I'm a history guy, I, my degree is in history, and, and it was like looking back in time a thousand years at Afghanistan. It's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, it's, it can be, it's kind of beautiful in its rugged sort of backwardsness in a way. Um, Iraq's a different story, but I, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll crack that nut here in a little bit. Uh, my brother, after I did my Afghanistan tour, it, you know, I came back. Right as I came back, the, the war in uh, Iraq kicked off March uh, 2003, and my brother, uh, he was a um, he was a Bradley guy. I'll, I'll show you a picture of a Bradley fighting vehicle. He ended up going over there right off the bat. He was in the first wave. He was part of the invasion across the border of Kuwait into uh, into Iraq. It went all the way up to Baghdad. And so I, I kind of you know my Afghanistan you know it was cool. I wasn't in you know we weren't in a, in a huge firefights all the time. So I was getting kind of jealous that he was getting all this action. He was loving it. Uh, he was sending me back letters all the time, telling me about his misadventures over there. So at this point in time, I got shifted over to Germany, um, a transformation thing with the army. Now I'll talk about that later on. And I wasn't complaining. Germany's Germany. Now, I understand this town right here has a pretty big Oktoberfest, and uh, people love German beer here. I'm a huge fan myself. I've been to Oktoberfest in Munich a couple times. Wouldn't trade those experiences for anything else. But it's a, it's a great place. But uh, from there. After my brother got done doing his thing over there for a year, uh, I was in the, uh, again, I was in the second wave of the Iraq invasion, or more of the insurgency. The Iraq, the, the war had actually shifted from more of a, um, you had the invasion, and then started settling into this insurgency issue. And it was, it was roughly about April, I, I say about 2004 is when we started recognizing the insurgency as an actual uh, ordeal. And I'll, I'll talk about the asymmetrical warfare and the counterinsurgency and all that, so I'll, I'll brush on that a little bit. But uh, that's, that's what we were dealing with there when I got on, on the scene. I spent my year over in Iraq. Uh, I was in, primarily focused on north of Baghdad in a little place called Bakiba, a Muqtadaya area. Ended up down in Fallujah for a spell. Ended up in uh, Najaf. Uh, it's a little bit different how we moved because I was in a different type of element. I was a paratrooper uh, my first time when I went to Afghanistan. So I was getting paid to jump out of airplanes. Uh, it's not as fun as it sounds. It's about five seconds of fun and then it's, you know, then you hit the ground, and when you're tall and weigh a little bit, it's not fun when you hit the ground. Um, but the, then they moved me into a, a Bradley, so I used to I was riding in the back of a 20-something ton vehicle. Again, when you're tall, six foot four, the army doesn't make vehicles to match your size, so uh, it was always in a little tin can I was riding in. But hey, it saved my butt a couple times, so I'm not going to complain too much. But um, yeah, and then I came back from Iraq, um, 2005, February-ish. And then I had a little bit left in, um, in Germany. So and at this point in time, I thought, hey, I had two deployments right under my belt. Maybe the wars are winding down. I'm going to get out and, and utilize this, you know, this $50,000 of college money Uncle Sam gave me, right? So I did that. I got out, grew a monstrous beard, and it was, it was impressive. I, I was really thrilled about it. And then the, the recruiter found me and said, hey, there's this unit right, right down the street. I was in Stillwater, Oklahoma, going to o Oklahoma State University. He's like, hey, there's a bunch of drill sergeants here, really chill unit, a bunch of NCOs, a bunch of sergeants, essentially. And he's like, hey, come over here, and you can just play part-time army. I was like, hey, I like soldiers. I like, uh, you know, talk a shop with those guys. Why not? That's not too much time. So I shaved the beard, tried to get in shape again, and then jumped into, uh, jumped into this unit where I've been a drill sergeant since 2008. And uh, so now pretty much what I do once a year, generally speaking, we go down to Fort Sill. Uh, we put on our little hats, 
and um, I'll show you pictures. That's, that's an example of the 82nd. That was my first unit right there. That's a lot of parachutes in the air. Uh, when you're actually a part of one of those little guys flying down, it's, it seems like fun, but there's a lot of guys, uh, a lot of dangerous stuff, you know, and mainly the guys in the air around you are the most dangerous part because you're running into people's parachutes. And here's what, here's what I used to do back in, that's exactly what I used to do right there. I think that might, could be me very, very easily, just hanging out when the ramp goes down. That's what you do in the back of a Bradley. This is where, we, this is where you live in a while, and then whenever they want to kick you out, they drop this ramp and you go running out. It's good times. But, um, and this is the unit, the, the Big Red One. Uh, the 82nd Airborne Division has been around actually before World War II. Um, they're one of the first airborne units. They jumped into D-Day. Uh, they actually jumped into Italy as well during World War II. Uh, the Big Red One here, named uh, conveniently for their Big Red One. Uh, they weren't that creative back in the day with their uh, catchphrases. But uh, that's actually supposedly, rumor is, that that's the first military patch ever, or Army patch. Army, we like to wear our patches. We like to wear our badges and stuff like that. The Marine Corps is a little bit different. They don't wear as much stuff as we do on their duty uniform. But we like to... We have to wear our stuff, and so that, that might have been the first one kind of created out of the, one of the myths are German underwear, red lining underwear. Somebody took some German underwear, carved out a one, and put it on the patch. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a heck of a story. And there I am with my uh, Smokey the Bear hat is what I call it. This is me uh, putting out fires since 2008. A lot of people, I think I confuse a lot of people going around in Stillwater. They don't know what a drill sergeant looks like. The nearest drill sergeants are three hours away from us, you know, so... Every now and then when I'm wearing that silly hat, uh, you know, they might think I'm a park ranger or something like that, which could be kind of entertaining. But yeah, I've been in the reserve since 2006, um, you know, and it's, it's been a good time. So I, I enjoy playing that drill sergeant for the most part, but um, it's, a, it's a challenging occupation. It's actually, I think, a harder occupation than being an infantryman in Iraq, to tell you the truth. There's even more responsibility. So. But we're going to get into the meat of, meat of why I, I feel like I'm here is to uh, talk about the transformation of the military and how I see the transformation of the military. And we're going to, we're going to try to attempt uh, to answer the questions where, where, we, uh, where we were. I kind of maybe made that one backwards. Where are we now and where do we go from here? All right. Are we moving too quick? Are we going too slow? Are we at the good pace? Are we doing too much change? Are we doing too little change? The, the problem about the military is like we, are, we, we don't ever find out these answers until well after the case, right? Um, we're going to find out about the transformation of our military years later or, or the next conflict. Uh, as, we, as we have, we've run into the hiccups of how we organize our military with the Iraq and Afghanistan campaign. We weren't really built for those campaigns quite yet. We were for the first part of Iraq, but we weren't for the second half of Iraq. And so um, sometimes the Army or the military in whole, I, I can... I mainly speak for the Army's sake because obviously that's my bread and butter. I know, I know them better than the Marine Corps or um, Air Force and, and Navy. But, um, but yeah, it's, the, the Army sometimes jumps on the gun on, on, on a change prematurely and sticks with it. It's a very large changes and sometimes it's hard and it's not necessarily it's a bad, bad decision. Sometimes the information is just not there to make it accurate. And sometimes we're just making predictive values on what the world, what the future global dynamics are going to be. Uh, Take, take our current situation, North Korea. North Korea is going to be an entirely different stage than Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's, that's a challenge that our army um, and armies of the world are going to have to um, deal with. But we'll talk about that briefly. At any point in time, um, you, know, if, you know, if you have any questions, we're going to have a good answer or a question and answer session at the end. So if you think of anything, even if it's, hey, is the army cool, you know, I'll tell you it is. We'll drive on. But hopefully you'll have some insightful questions for me. And hopefully I'll give you some insightful information. We'll make it a deal. All right, so the changing face of the Army and creatively the big things. All right, so these are some of the, some of the changes that have occurred within the structure of the Army. And the Army is a behemoth. The Army is a very huge organization. They say that the Army is the best logistical train in the entire world. They can, you know, that is what the primary part of the army is, is logistics, is, is getting bullets and beans to the people on the front lines. And, and nobody's better at it than the U.S. military. And combine that with the Air Force, with the, um, with the flight, and then with the Navy, with the shipping, it's, a, it's, it, it's beyond belief when you see it. You know, I, don't, I don't think any corporation could touch it. It's just so much, uh, it runs pretty smooth. If anything that runs smooth, logistics kind of runs smooth in the army. All right, but we're going to talk about the division, and those, those flashy little patches I showed you are represented. That, those are the symbols of a division element, and everything in the Army is broken down in structures. You have 
corps, and corps are made up of divisions, and divisions are made up of battalions, or I'm sorry, brigades. Brigades are made up of battalions, battalions are made up of companies, companies are made up of platoons, platoons are made up of squads, squads are made up of teams, and teams are made up of jokers like me. So that's, that's, how, that's how it comes down from going up, down the, down the chain. The division is probably the most common thing that you're gonna see on a military installation. You guys have uh, Fort Riley, Kansas here. Uh, that's actually home of the Big Red One, that, that patch I had there. Uh, they're represented by the division size element is what, offer, or, uh, what sits upon Fort, Fort Riley. And uh, some, some of the information here, this is, they say it's a small self-sufficient wartime unit. And what that essentially means is you can send a division out into a place like Iraq or into a place like a theater, let's say Africa, for instance. And a division can fight a war kind of by itself. It has all, not, not very effectively, it depends on who, who you're fighting, but uh, they have all the support internally and they can, they can keep themselves operational. They have uh, three maneuver brigades, which that means those are your fighting elements. Those are the elements, whether it's gonna be armor, and when I say armor, I mean um, tanks, um, artillery attached with that, as well as like the CAV scouts. Uh, and, and, and my, uh, my uh, little group, uh, the infantrymen. All right, so there's uh, traditionally three maneuver brigades, one artillery, one engineer, and that's usually in the uh, heavier portion of, um, attached to the heavier brigades and whatnot. One air, and what air means is essentially like your, your Apaches. Everybody knows what an Apache is, so a fighter, or maybe, maybe not, uh, the, the fighter helicopters that the Army has, and you have your Blackhawks and your Chinooks, and those are all your uh, logistic and troop carriers. And then your smaller support entities, the people who pay you, the people who feed you, and the people who get you your mail. Those are all very important. Um, especially if I'm over in Iraq and I'm not getting paid, when I'm supposed to be getting paid, hey, I want to go out and you know buy some cheap, you know, bootleg DVDs, just like anybody else. I need some. I need a little bit of scratch for what I'm doing, right? Um, typically, they're commanded. Uh, the division is commanded by a major general, and um, and I have a little anecdote here about major generals. So a major general is pretty high, and it ranges from 10,000 10, to 20,000 uh, soldiers. Now, the difference between a major general and a guy like myself, as you can see, there, there's tons of differences. I mean, obviously, time in the army, money primarily. That's how I say, it. but. In a place like Iraq, you'll see, you'll see a difference between what makes up a staff sergeant and what makes up a major general. Uh, after the Battle of Fallujah, we came all out, and you know, when you're in, when you're in a war zone, sometimes it's kind of hard to wash your uniforms and whatnot. You get a little, sometimes you might not get a shower for 20 days. Uh, so sometimes your uniform starts to show that. And sometimes you have, you know, when you're in the desert, you get a little white salt rings on your uniform. You might have a little blood, you might have a little dirt, all sorts of stuff. And you're probably not gonna be within the shaving regulations either. I was in none of those regulations, and uh, you know, I look like I just came from uh, you know straight out of the jungles of Da Nang or something. You know, I, I don't. I, we were looking rough. Well, we just got done with like a seven-day fight, and uh, we were told that our commanding general, who wasn't at the fight, was going to come and give us a uh, you know, hey, good job, good job, boys, uh, good fight. Well, I mean, we're we're dirty, grungy. We're actually trying to find razors to shave because somebody says, hey, the general's coming. You have to look presentable. And we were doing what I was doing on that Bradley right there, laying down, looking dirty and, and you know grungy, trying to eat my little MRE, uh, get a little uh, fake food happiness. And um, general comes up here and is very clean DCUs, like he just got them from the PX. And actually, I think they were starched. I don't know where you go find a dry cleaner in Iraq, but uh, he found one. And um, you know he had clean boots, look look like he, looked like he should on a poster. And I look like uh, you know. I was fighting in a whole different army, you know, so that's, that's a difference kind of like how you can see between, uh, you know, I mean, he earns it. I'm not going to take anything away from him. He was, he's probably, he's way more valuable than I am, but, you know, that's a difference, though. So. Okay, so, and what, the, and what you saw there was the traditional, traditional military organization, the division. The division's been the heart and soul of the army since, I would say, uh, since uh, the Civil War. But uh, it's really come into the modern military. Since World War II, you have these division, uh, you have 1st ID storming, four, four, uh, I'm sorry, 1st and 4th ID, and when I say ID, I mean infantry division, storming the beaches of Omaha and Utah Beach. You have the 82nd Airborne Division and then 101st jumping into D-Day, you know, uh, jumping behind German lines. That's what a division is, and that's where we, uh, why they wear those uh, pretty little patches. And uh, so that's the big army. Well, now it's breaking down into something smaller they're called the brigade combat teams, and this is a direct reflection of our current situation in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, a brigade combat team, they like to sometimes call it the mini division. 
And it's a smaller, it's a smaller version of, of a division. But, and the key thing, the reason why it makes them sound or where they're uh, relatable to the division is because they're self-sufficient. They're just a smaller organization. Uh, you have your different varieties. You have an infantry striker and armor variation. Armor, again, being a tanker heavy. Uh, striker is this new, new uh, vehicle the Army's coming along in the last 10 years. It has like, I think it has six wheels on it. It's a, it's a funky little vi vehicle, but uh, the Army's really, really loves it. So they're making a lot of these uh, brigade combat teams around those strikers. Now, for instance, an infantry BCT brigade combat team, it would consist of two rifle battalions, one cab battalion, one fire battalion, and that's going to be your artillery when I say fire, and one support battalion. Um, and when I, when I say, and a little, my little comment here, uh, what, are, what are those legs doing here? I mean, I've got to give you a little backstory on what a leg is. In the Army, we have some derogatory words, what we call their people. And we all know derogatory words, and usually they're not ones that you would share in front of a classroom. But these ones, um, if I shared in the military classroom, they'd be like, oh, man, that's kind of out of line. But in here, it doesn't mean anything so horribly, unless you're in the Army. What a leg is, is anybody who is not jump qualified, anybody who doesn't jump out of airplanes. We think that patch, the 82nd Airborne, think, I, I've never found a unit that loves themselves more than the 82nd Airborne Division. I don't think it, I don't think it exists. Uh, they call themselves uh, America's Honor Guard. Um, they, you know, it's the dog and pony capital of the U.S. Army. Uh, they're, they love themselves. They really do. And I was loving myself, too, when I was wearing that maroon beret and that patch. Uh, and it, I used to snub my nose down at the legs, as we saw them. Guys who, who, you know, guys and women who didn't, you know, jump out of airplanes. We thought we were really hot stuff. Uh, we also have another word that is a double combination. It's called a pogue. It's not that creative. It actually just stands for person other than a grunt, right? That's all, I mean, that's, that's as far as we got creative-wise creative in the infantry. But it is the worst thing I can call somebody. The worst thing. It's like, you are a dirty pogue. And that means that you do not do anything for the Army. And, that, and it's not true, but it's just that we like to pump ourselves up and make ourselves feel good. And uh, there's definitely a hierarchy, and we, we, we know where we are in the hierarchy. We look up to the Ranger Battalion, and Ranger Battalion's the uh, elite of the infantry. Ranger Battalion wants to be Special Forces, and the Special Forces guys kind of want to be like the even more elite Special Forces Delta Force. I want to be Special Forces so I can grow a, a gnarly beard. That is the one benefit to being in Special Forces. I'm not a fan of shaving every day. But, you know, I got to do what I got to do, right? But, um, so, so those are, those are and, and Pogue, and, you know, I, I use it in my daily routine all the time. But, uh, you know, it's not that bad of a word. It secretly is, but it's not that bad of a word. Uh, so a brigade combat team is generally commanded by a colonel, a full board colonel, as we call them. Um, and so that's, that's obviously below a major general. And each rifle battalion consists of uh, roughly 650 troops. So as I said earlier, there's a battalion makes up a brigade, and then those brigades make up a division. And then uh, they're self-sufficient, mobile, and uh, get your A-bags, we're going somewhere new. And that's kind of the experience, I'm going to relate this to where, when I was in Afghanistan, I was in the light infantry. I was one of these paratrooper guys. And so essentially what all I brought to Afghanistan with me was a rucksack. I had two duffel bags full of my stuff, like extra uniforms, extra gear, stuff like that. And then everything, I, you know, my weapon, my ammo, you know, all, all the cool guy stuff, right? And all the extra stuff they wanted to give me, like radios and all the stuff I didn't want to carry anymore. Well, the, the reason why we're set up that way is that in Afghanistan, we moved a lot. We'd, we'd be stationed in some place, and I was only in Afghanistan for six months. This was back in the day when it was like really quick rotations. Uh, we were in a place like, say, Salerno for three months. It was a little fob, a forward operating base. And we were there for probably about three, three weeks, and we picked up, and we moved to another part of Afghanistan. It was that easy. We didn't have huge tanks to move. We didn't have all this equipment. You pretty much pack up what you got, throw it in your rucksack, and you're going to a new uh, sector in Afghanistan. And that's how it worked. And that's kind of how the brigade combat teams kind of modeled. They can move around in a sector. They can pick up and move to a new theater w way more rapid than a division. A division takes a lot of effort, a lot, a lot of resources, a lot of time to get up and going. Except for those beloved uh, 82nd Airborne Troopers. Their creed is 18 hours anywhere in the world, wheels up, jumping into whatever country you want to say they're jumping into. The claim is that the 82nd Airborne Division can load up into planes and jump into combat in 18 hours anywhere in the world. I, I personally haven't seen that happen yet, but uh, you know, hey, I, I take the word out. The 82nd would never lie to me. But, all right, so I'll recap real quick. So the, the structure, the one thing I want to focus on here is like we really have broken down the old school structure of these massive organizations 
in the army. These, these almost unwieldy or unwieldy sort of like big divisions, and we're breaking them down into brigade combat teams. That's why they can more effectively rotate in and out of places like Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't, I don't know if you guys have heard. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the military, like the soldiers now are going into rapid. Uh, you know, they, they go for a year, they get about six months break, then they're back again, and, and then rinse and repeat, right? And that's kind of, uh, you know, a symptom of the brigade combat team. They're so easy to move and so easy, easy to mobilize. Isn't that, that's kind of uh, what happens with that. And it's a benefit and kind of a, uh, you know, a hindrance with it, you know, if you're a career soldier. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're moving down into more flexible organizations. Whereas the Cold War version would be these massive divisions of tank legions, which we're going to talk about. All right, armor, what they like to say, death before dismount. And what that means is they will die before they jump out of that tank and have to fight anybody. I don't blame them. I've seen the M1 Abrams do a lot of damage. And I've seen people try to shoot at M1 Abrams, and uh, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not phasing it. I one time ran behind the M1 Abrams. It fired into a building. I thought I blew up. I was, man, it, it, was, it was messy. But armor, armor's a unique beast now these days in the Army. Whereas, really the M1 Abrams, they say that, that this tank that we have, we've had it since the 80s. I want to say Panama might have been one of, it was during, during the Panama invasion um, era. I don't think we brought any M1 Abrams. This is the same time period that we were testing out the Apache, um, possibly the Black Hawk. I think the Black Hawk maybe came a little bit afterwards. But this is, a bad mamma jamma when it comes down to tanks. I don't think anybody has a tank that can take it out. I don't even know if our own tanks can take it out. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty strong thing. It has a couple of vulnerabilities from the, from the below and from the top, but uh, we'll maybe discuss that later. But um, the invasion versus the insurgency. So what you had here, the invasion, think about the Cold War. If you guys know anything about the Cold War, we were talking legions of Russian tanks just rolling through Eastern Europe and taking over, uh, you know, France, you know, the other part of Germany, all this sort of thing. So armor was a big thing back in the 60s, leading up to uh, the 80s, early 90s, and that was pretty much where the meat of combat was. Was, was armor versus armor, air versus air, and uh, you know, whoever has air superiority, whoever has the best fighter planes, MIGs versus F-16s, MIGs versus you know, uh, whatever else you have versus our M1 Abrams versus. Uh, Oh, I, I, I used to know these. I used to know these tank nomenclatures for the Russians, and that tells you how much we've strayed away from Cold War stuff. Because when's the last time we fought some? Well, we had a little bit of Russian tanks in Iraq, not Afghanistan. But that's kind of the point of it. Our tanks came in there, smoked the Iraqis, smoked them. Well, I'm pretty sure we didn't lose a single one. Uh, Desert Storm, I think, were even more effective. And plus, with with the joint, you know, we have such a our our military operates in conjunction with each other. You have, your, you have your, your Navy supporting the ground troops on the ground. You got Army, Marine Corps, and you have, you have your Air Force right above them. Everybody's in the same theater working together, and it, it was unstoppable. You put any kind of, um, I, I, I personally feel like you put any kind of conventional Army on the field, we're, we're gonna smoke you. The problem is, is we already smoked everybody, so who's left, what else are we gonna do with all these tanks? So we have plenty of tanks. We're still shipping tanks over to Iraq whenever I was there. And so now we've switched to this, this new type of combat. We're going to counterinsurgency sort of stuff, right? And what's a tank, uh, I mean, is a tank gonna shoot a two-man guys that are just kind of hop over the wall or, or that plants an IED? The tank, you know, it has a 120 meter cannon on it. There's really, and it's made for blowing up tanks. So we started running into this problem here that the tankers were had these tanks, but they're not needed. They almost cause more destruction than what we want to cause over there. And that's, it seems kind of a funny sort of thing to say more destruction, but you got to remember that uh, this war is kind of a unique war, and it's been kind of like this since Vietnam, is the, the winning the hearts and minds sort of cliched strategy. And that's what we were trying to do in Iraq, and that's kind of where we failed a little bit in the very beginning of Iraq. Um, and, and then we, we kind of failed as well in uh, Afghanistan on the same token. But, um, but yeah, so, so these tanks, our tanks are way too destructive, causing too much. I mean, just a tank driving on one of the roads, tearing it all up. Our little Bradleys, which are little the kid brothers of the tanks, are tearing up their roads, you know? Just driving around doing our normal thing is tearing up their, you know, their infrastructure of their country, you know? Hey, they're not, get, they're not getting too happy with that, right? So the tankers, 
they start going down to Humvees and they start doing more infantry work. Now they like to claim they're infantrymen, but they're not really infantrymen. I mean, there's, there's a whole different thing. And they'll argue to you all day long that they're an infantryman. And they're kind of doing the same thing, but, um, but really what they are is a tanker without a tank. That's what they are. And um, so they're, they're having to do some of the same type of missions we are. And um, the army is actually kind of, some people have kind of thrown it out there. It's like, do, are we, do we even need tanks anymore? I mean, they're expensive. Upkeep is expensive. Uh, they break down. They, we've had some breakdown right in the middle of a firefight. A tank just throws off its tracks. And that is a mess. When you're getting shot at and you're trying to put tank tracks back on a vehicle, that's, that's, I mean, I don't do that. I feel sorry for the guys that are doing that. I don't mess around the uh, tracks. That's not my gig. But, uh, you know, I, I try to make it easier on them. I try to, you know, alleviate some of the fire, you know, going around. But I'm not messing with tanks. I don't know. I can barely even change my own tire in my own car. <laughs> don't put me on an army vehicle. But, uh, but here, here's one of the things. Uh, the possible transition of us, do we need tanks anymore? We have missile systems that can take out any tank. Um, I, there's a Javelin missile. I think, I think it's roughly about $50,000 a pop. Probably more than that, actually. So it's a sophisticated missile. And a guy who has a GED and makes probably about you know, $1,000 a month can just waste one of those in a flash <laughs> and just do some hardcore destruction. It, it's, you know, there's the argument. Do we need these tanks anymore when we have these missile systems that can just even out the playing field, tanks versus infantry? I still think there's a, there's a place for tanks. Uh, being a mechanized infantry, which what, what I was in the Bradleys, we work they're very closely together. Uh, sometimes there's a tanker-heavy battalion, sometimes there's an infantry-heavy battalion. Those two go together, peanut butter and jelly-ish. Uh, but you know, there's a very real future of an army without tanks. But I don't think it will happen. But a lot of people are promoting it. You can't. There are no tanks in Afghanistan right now. There's no place to do it. There's there's no way. Uh, the the roads can barely, barely support a Humvee. They're not going to support a, uh, I think a tank weighs probably 30 plus tons. It's, it's, a, it's a big boy. It's, those roads are going to give out each and every time. But how am I doing on time? Okay, good, good. I don't want to run out or anything. Uh, so here's another big thing I want to talk about. And, and we kind of hinted on this so far. Uh, asymmetrical warfare. And, um, and pretty much what this is, this is talking about it's, it's unconventional warfare. It's, it's the cliched, again, guerrilla sort of fighting. Um, it's not, it's pretty much, there are no traditional lines uh, on, drawn on the battlefield. The entire theater is the battlefield. And this is going to have tremendous results on how we're structuring our army now. We already saw the breakdown of the unit structures, possibly losing the tanks. And then we're going to see the makeup of who makes up the, the soldier these days. But unconventional warfare, uh, the biggest thing, the tactics, the tactics of the insurgency. And you, you'll see this probably in just about every insurgency, uh, you know, homegrown. And you would see it in our own if, if, you know, Red Dawn happened here. You would see the same sort of situation here. And, and Red Dawn, if you've seen the new one, see, see the earlier one. It's way better. It's, uh, you, know, you really feel like a wolverine. But, um, but the Iraqi insurgency, now the problem is, is that after the, the Iraqi Republican Guard was pretty much knocked out, in their, in their actual official army, there was no more guys with uniforms. There's no more bad guys. I say bad guys, but there's no more opposing forces that had an actual uniform that said, you know, Mr. Soldier, Iraqi Army, that, that you knew who you're going up against. And that makes it very difficult to fight an enemy. And sometimes we're not very good at that as, as a U.S. Army. We, we struggled with it quite a bit. And the problem with that is when you struggle with that, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of um, extra damage that can occur in the theater whenever you struggle to find your enemy. And, and we have, we've had a lot of growing pains with that. Uh, the tactics that they generally use, and the IED is the biggest, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. They usually use a lot more ambush tactics. They don't, they don't bring, if they meet us on the battlefield, we're going to smoke them, like I said. Even 30 of us, uh, if they outnumber us, even by 60, 30 of us are going to beat them each and every time. Um, we typically like to fight in a 3 to 1 ratio and have the upper hand, but we always have the upper hand. We have planes, we have helicopters, we always have those assets uh, at our fingertips. Hopefully you have those assets and hopefully your radio is working. Sometimes it doesn't and then you think, oh man, they were full of crap when they were telling me that we can win all these battles. But, um, but we always do. 
And uh, the tactics, you know, they like, they like to do a lot of ambushes. In Iraq, what I saw primarily, I didn't see any, I, I don't feel like I fought a professional soldier until the Battle of Fallujah. I think most of these guys were locals. Most of them were, some of them were bullied into it. Some of them, you know, you had these outside fighters that would come into the neighborhood, threaten your family, uh, or offer you money because you're a dirt poor farmer, and hand you an RPG and say, hey, when the American patrol comes around, fire this RPG. And you saw that. And sometimes they get lucky, but sometimes they fire an RPG over a wall. Uh, that thing's inaccurate as all get out. And they're not gonna hit anything. But they don't stick around to fight though either. They pop at you and then they disappear. And uh, when they do show up, every now and then they like to test you and they'll show up and we, we put them down. And then they'll, uh, they'll just start you know, lobbing mortars at you at your base. They'll start, you know, all the sort of stuff. They, but they won't meet you on the field uh, until, until, that, until you get a big thing like Fallujah. And we'll talk about Fallujah a little bit. Now, the, the primary, the primary um, killer for, for our guys over there, for wounding and, and, and us getting casually, is, is the IED. And for those of you who don't know what the IED is, it's the Improvised Explosive Device. And what that is is essentially the most basic form of this that you're seeing over there is an artillery round. An artillery round that's used to put in a cannon, fired miles away, blowing up. What they, they came up with this is a pretty ingenious way to fight us. What they do is they just bury a little hole on the road, stick this shell down in there, put some sort of device, sometimes just call it on a cell phone whenever American troops are rolling by, blow it up. And it's an artillery shell, and some of these artilleries uh, have like a kill radius of 300 meters easy, right? That's a, that's a, big, that's a big area. And so if you, if you bury this in the ground, you don't have to expose yourself. You can just blow us up, and you, know, you don't lose anybody, and then they, they lose their people, right? Uh, they really started, when I was, I usually jump between, and I, most of my experience I'm going to talk about uh, Iraq, because Iraq is really where I saw, where I really felt like I felt, I saw real combat. And... And it was a different time period. Afghanistan has kind of turned into what Iraq is now, but it wasn't that. We, we'd won the show really early in, in Afghanistan. Um, but, so Iraq, the first, I, I, a lot of our missions, we were in Humvees versus uh, Bradleys. Now Bradley can take a licking. I'm telling you, it can take a licking and keep on ticking and keep on going. Uh, Humvees are, are not so much. There was a lot of, a lot of problems <coughs> with soldiers going on. A lot of our Humvees weren't up, up, up to par on some of the missions. We, we were taking them past their actual uh, purpose. A lot of these Humvees weren't made to go on patrols. They were just made for, you know, cleared roads to go back and forth, not not be engaging in, uh, you know, ambushes or anything. So so a lot of our Humvees took a beating, and they weren't made for a lot of the stuff we were putting them through. When you're in a, when you're in a Humvee and you get hit by an IED, it, it, it's a little scary. The thing that you know, the way you avoid that is by speed and distance. It's harder for them to hit you when you're go, when you're cruising 70, 70 miles per hour on the highway, right? And they, they have they have you know regular paved roads and whatnot. Uh, Iraq, Iraq's not really that. Before we did all the damage we did, it was kind of a progressive sort of Middle Eastern state, in my opinion. Um, but the Bradley, at, in the very beginning, it would wake me up because when you're in a tin can like a Bradley, and you're stuffed in there, it's the Bradley's supposed to hold what about six people? Well, we like to cram about nine or ten people in there, and you double your size whenever you're wearing your body armor and all your gear and grenades and you know, all the cool stuff that we have. So you're just scrunched up against Bradley, and the only way you can communicate with anybody when the Bradley's going full speed is to yell right into their ear, because it's so loud, you can't hear anything. You're already miserable. The best thing you can do is just fall asleep. That's the only thing you can do. All you can do is move your head, pretty much. So you rest, rest it on the deal, and you just prop it up on your rifle and go to sleep. When you get blown up, you, you wake up. You go, oh, yeah, we got hit. Uh, and then they'll unlock the ramp, we'll go out, and then we'll go uh, do our part. Now. Right when I was leaving, they started double stacking some of these IEDs, and they actually took out they took out a couple tanks. I remember one time I was rolling up into another FOB, we were a totally unrelated mission. We saw a tank that was on fire, and I was man, I didn't know they could actually take out our tanks. And they had stacked and stacked and stacked. I think the word was like five or six anti-tank mines on top of each other, and then dug them underneath there and blew the blew the crap out of it. And there's there's certain things you just can't you can't fight against. And IEDs are a very hard thing to fight against. And that's why the Afghanis have really, or I should say the Taliban and, and their related parties, have really adopted this use because they saw how effective it was in Iraq. We were very slow to transition to vehicles with the V, the V bottoms is how they're shaped. And that's the way that they absorb the blast of an IED is very effective and it doesn't cause as much damage to the vehicle. And that's what the army kind of came out, started rolling out this type of vehicle later in the theater of the Iraq war. I, I assume, I think they're called like an MRAP or something. I haven't ever seen them personally. And I think they have transitioned those to Afghanistan, but at the same, same time that the Afghanistan um, 
the, the, the fighters there have really transitioned into hardcore IED use. Um, like I said, they're man to man. They generally don't don't get us too well, but you know they smartly use these these IEDs and, and they're, they're getting better, more sophisticated with them. So they are they are becoming more uh, damaging. You can use all sorts of stuff. Right? I've walked by on a patrol and they just had some C4 in a trash can. I kind of considered that an IED and blew up the trash can and scared the crap out of me. But uh, yeah, nobody was hurt. It's just C4. Um, but there's a difference. One time I was. We were on patrol, and they like to do this thing called daisy chaining them, right? And I told you they have like a 300 meter radius per shell. Well, they like to put like six of them all in one little area. So we were, we were out doing our thing, just kind of chilling and kicking around. And my guy goes, hey, Sergeant, hey, hey, I found an ID right here. It's like, oh, crap, we're standing right here. We're out in the middle of the open. Somebody else starts kicking around. Hey, crap, found another one. Next thing we know, there's like 10 of them. We're standing on 10 IEDs right now. 300 meter kill radius. So we were just like, I might want to get out of here. Uh, we called the Johnny Five robot. Little guy drives in there and he disarms them or blows them up. That was kind of cool. But you know, those guys are overworked. The EID, EOD guys, the Hurt Locker, if you will, the Hollywood type. You know, those guys, those cats are uh, stressed. But and um, I guess I kind of already briefed on this a little bit. The Iraqi insurgent. What I saw: uh, the local fighter versus a professional from abroad. The professional from abroad being somebody from, even strangely enough, Chechnya. Uh, we had some Chechnyan uh, fighters in Fallujah, actually. Those, those were hardcore guys. I, they, they know how to fight. Uh, they fight the Russians, and the Russians don't mess around. Um, they're, they're a little, the Russians seem to be a little less strict on their rules of engagement. So uh, you have to be tight, tough if you're fighting Russians. But the, um, the local fighter, they generally weren't as much a threat. They, they get lucky every now and then. But, um, but the professional from abroad, that, that was the danger. But they weren't really the, the majority. A lot of people wanted, wanted to come to Iraq and Afghanistan to, to you know, fight us, but. Um, okay, so what, the, what that was essentially talking about, so the asymmetrical unconventional warfare, it's a lot of emphasis on ambushing, uh, blending in with the populace, and really taking an open fight on their terms, which is congested areas, places where they can hit us and, and, and egress out and not have to uh, be in danger of any kind of sustained firefight with us, because we're going to win a sustained firefight. Okay, so I'll, I'll transition into uh, this other thing, the other big thing, the infantry woman, the female infantry woman. I never thought this was going to happen, uh, but I think, I think we're really moving to this point, and um, I, th I think it's going to happen pretty soon. And the, the two reasons I've heard this brought up, and there, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons why, and, and if you don't know, uh, women are not allowed to serve until, until this ruling happened within the last couple of months, they're not allowed to serve in the artillery, uh, tank, infantry, or special, oper special forces. Those branches that they're not allowed to serve in. Uh, you can be attached to them and work with them, but you can't hold that occupation in, in the Army or the, or the Marine Corps. Um, and so some, what some people have been saying for why we have this is, is, a, is a pure numbers game. And it's almost a strange thing about the generation of soldiers. Now, this generation, and your guys' generation, is a unique generation. And I don't know if I'm included in that generation. I'm 31 now. I don't know where I sit in this, which is kind of insulting. Well, I'll tell you later on this next deal about where I sit, my generation. I think we're like a Pepsi generation. That's lame. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but um, but numbers, see, a lot, a lot less people of this generation are even qualified to serve in, in the military. Uh, the physical stuff, well, you know, there's... There's a lot, and even we talk about childhood obesity is on the rise, um, diabetes, and that all the health problems or all the stuff that we discuss about as a culture of Americans is actually you're going to start seeing that. And, and who's your who's your recruitable base? Who's going to be able to actually hit? Do we change the standards or do we keep the standards and and just you know have a smaller military, have smaller people, smaller pool to to draw from? And, and I, I've heard this discussion, and it does kind of make sense. And it goes into you know, the fitness and the numbers. We need people to join the infantry. We're going to need people just to join the Army, period. Uh, even though we're on a decline right now, we're going we're gonna to start as, as Afghanistan closes, as long as we don't get into anything else, our numbers are going to start going back down to pre-war numbers, most likely, uh, as we do pretty much in every other war afterwards. Um, but uh, the Xbox generation, I think they, they might call you guys that. Yeah, I don't mind playing Xbox either. But, uh, you know... Your kill-death ratio on Call of Duty, uh, most of you guys probably should know this, uh, does not exactly equate to being a good soldier, you know. Uh, if you can get 20 kills in Call of Duty and call in whatever the past year, I don't know what you do, but uh, that's going to make you a good soldier. And don't ever, if you guys decide to go into the Army, 
Don't ever go to some old sergeant and be like, hey, sergeant, hey, this isn't what I learned like on uh, Rainbow Six or Ghost Recon. He will punch you in the face <laughs> until you don't ever talk to him again about your Xbox skills versus his real army skills. But I've seen it happen. It's, it's kind of funny. But, um, but um, and also, I think, I think even bigger, uh, a more significant reason for the reason why uh, female infantrymen are, are soon going to be amongst the ranks of the 11 Bravos, as we call them, is a, pr a product of the blurred lo front lines and this asymmetrical warfare and unconventional warfare, and, and the unique roles women have played in such a, in, in the cultural fight, uh, no, I, want, I don't want to say cultural fight, um, just the cultural differences between the West and uh, the Middle East, uh, very, there's a lot of sensitivity with, with uh, females in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially Afghanistan, it's a very conservative um, Islamic country. So, but you know, some of their females are playing the game too. Some of their females are wearing explosive vests and, and coming to. So, so we have to treat. We can't just you can't just assume that a woman is not going to be a combatant. She very well easily could be. But I am not. We want to be sensitive, and I don't want to search a woman. So we have women, women teams. They're, they're actually just a, a team of women, like five or six of them that sometimes accompany accompany infantrymen, and their whole task is to you know search the women and, and deal with the women. That's so why we don't anger the males or, or cause, a, cause a situation that we don't need, right? You, you, don't, you never want unwarranted action if you don't need it, right? Um, no, you don't want any kind of extra, extra damage or destruction or anything like that. And women have been playing this role and as well as like MP roles. Now, here's another transition from kind of like this Cold War era to the modern day uh, army is the, the military policemen. The military pol policemen, back in the day, they were the guys who sat up in London and we're cracking Joes who were going to the bars, you know, in World War II and getting too drunk and rowdy when they came back on, on post. These days, they're going on patrols in Iraq. They're, they're no longer these guys who are back in the rear making sure that the order is going on. They, they do do that, but they also escort prisoners long distances throughout Iraq. Or they go on patrols and they're finding bad guys, uh, just like anybody else. As much as it pains me as a grunt to say that, that they're doing the same thing I am somewhat, but just probably not as good. I'll stick by that. But... Um, but, the, but they're out there. Women are out there fighting this war just like their, their male counterparts. And they make, you know, a lot of people make a significant case that, hey, if, if they're doing the job, why shouldn't they be allowed to be in the ranks? Because it, you do promote faster if you're in the infantry, if you're, in, uh, if you're a tanker, if you're an artilleryman. If you're in the combat arms, you typically promote faster. So uh, career women who want to be professional soldiers, uh, this is kind of a hindrance towards them to making it all the way up to the top in, a, you know, in an equal time frame. So, that is definitely going to be a change in this post 9-11 sort of military. And I'd say post, post this Iraq and Afghanistan experiment. This has been kind of a weird, weird thing for our country. And we're going to see a lot of changes coming out. And something I didn't address in here as well is actually homosexuality is actually, uh, it, it, don't ask, don't tell has been nixed. That, I mean, that's not going on anymore. So you can't be kicked out of the military if you say, if you say you're openly homosexual. You know, so I mean, that's... Uh, the army's changing. As, as culture changes, so is the military. Uh, the military has traditionally done this alongside, uh, you know, uh, African Americans um, serving. Some of the first, um, you know, equatable positions were, were African American units in the Civil War and whatnot. You know, um, so the army sometimes now the army's role isn't to be a cultural igniter and the, you know social change, but but it often serves that way. And uh, you know if it's a positive move and it's and if it's mirroring culture, our own society, then you know that's that's the way it is. Um, and, and the argument is is you know gender integration is it too soon or way overdue? Uh, who's to say? Uh, there's definitely going to be benefits towards it. Uh, definitely, definitely benefits for women soldiers. Uh, but there's a lot of potential problems that I don't think other people understand is going to happen. And it's a lot of disciplinarian uh, sort of issues within the infantry world. The infantry world is is it's a very testosterone high. And this isn't an excuse for any bad, ex but it's. There's going to be conflicts, and, and the army's going to have its hands full dealing with this. It's going to take a lot of issues and a lot of time before we're smoothly running any kind of uh, females in, in the infantry side by side male counterparts. Uh, it's, it's just unrealistic to think that there's not going to be problems, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen and won't, it can't be successful by any means. But uh, that, that's a dramatic change on, in the face of the military, the Marine Corps, and the army. After we see this, that's going to be it's going to be a different army. All right, so we got the drone. Everybody hears about the drone. I don't, I've seen some drones, I've seen some weird drones. I say to model airplane to the Predator, and if for any, again, you know, you know, I guess I grew up on 80s, 90s movies probably. So uh, the Predator, he bleeds green, I don't know if you guys knew that, but it's not the same Predator I'm talking about though. Uh, the Predator drone, he, he has, he, uh, this, this thing has two Hellfire missiles, and that's the that's thing that's 
rocking people, rocking Al Qaeda over in Yemen. You know, they're flying these drones around and just locking on to these guys and zapping them. And you even have certain things called what I call a model airplane. We had even in Iraq. It's, it's really literally what you go to a park and see those guys flying those those airplanes. It's, it's one of those, and he just. Whoosh, throws it in the air, it catches wind, turns on the engine, and it flies around, and it actually gives us intel. It'll fly around our sector and give us pictures, satellite imagery. It's, it's pretty cool, it's pretty handy. Uh, as our technology gets even better, we'll be able to communicate directly with those drone pilots, that's a hope. Um, you know, and get, get eyes on the ground. Now, uh, there, there was even uh, a drone combat award, because the drones have been killing a lot of bad guys. And uh, some of those guys were wanting their, you know, wanting their due. And I, kinda, I can kind of see that. They're, they're serving a vital role. And it is, I think, a wave of the future, this more of a drone integrated thing. But some people, we get a little too far. You know, we go into popular mechanics and read, flip through that, and you'll see these, like, robots from, like, RoboCop and stuff like that. I mean, that's really far away. I mean, you still need dudes on the ground, boots uh, kicking down doors. But um, the unmanned vehicles prospect is very, very interesting. There's, there's a lot of things you can do with that. And I think it's, um, I think we're going to see some neat stuff come out. Uh, and, and, of course, warfare always brings out some you know, American ingenu uh, ingenuity for uh, cool guy technology. So, hey, maybe that's what we'll have here. But the drone, it's, it's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome technology. All right, so this is, I'm gonna use this little portion and I call it the little things. And why the little things matter. And those were the big, big changes, post or pre, pre Cold War to, you know, as, as post 9-11 sort of thing. And, um, and these are just, I mean, there's a slew of other things that have changed and a lot more transformations, but um, on the big side of things. But here's some little things that I think really matter. And, and why does stuff matter? There's a, there's a guy who wrote a book, his name is Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. It's called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of, of Killing, I believe. And um, he really talks about, and it's an interesting, it's a, it's a fabulous read if you ever get a chance to read it. He talks about that, that man has a natural aversion to killing. That it's not, it's not, it's not, natural for us to want to kill somebody. And he talks about some, a lot of historical perspectives from even the Civil War that when, when we all watch the movies, Civil War movies and you have these large units that just sit across from each other and just fire from 15, 20 meters away. Well, what they have found that not very many people, the casualty rate was very low per minute. If you're, you're sitting right in front of a group and you have, you know, 30, 40 rifles pointed at another group of 30, 40 rifles, you should probably see a lot more people getting uh, falling or getting injured. Well, that wasn't the case. According to his study, uh, he found out there was a study produced by the Army after World War II, and they found that only about 15, I think it was about 15 to 25 percent of all riflemen in World War II fired their rifle. That's a dramatic number. You watch, you, know, you watch your, your Banner Brothers, you watch your same Prior Ryan, everybody's firing, everybody's killing, killing, you know, Nazis and whatnot. But they found that wasn't the case. They found that a lot, and, and he attributes this to this, this natural aversion to killing. That, that man doesn't want to kill. Uh, man, or he's hesitant to do so. And now a lot of times in a firefight, you'll have one person doing, doing the work and everybody else is kind of busying themselves with something else, whether it's, it's getting more ammo to the, to the guy who's doing all the, you know, all the, I shouldn't say work, but you know, the, the primary muscle of the fight. Or, or they're healing, they're, they're, they busy themselves with the healing of anybody who might've got hurt. Um, people, people just generally don't like to kill. So this was alarming to the army. This is kind of alarming to the army. They don't want they don't want their infantrymen. They don't want their guys on the ground hesitant to shoot. So the army started thinking about some other things. They started um, some certain programs like their marksmanship program. Uh, back in the day, it was just like a target. Whenever you fired your weapon, it was a target, and it was just like crosshairs, and you fire it, and you try to get into the crosshairs. Well, the little thing, and, and, and Colonel Grossman discusses this. They started moving to silhouettes, and silhouettes actually kind of look like a human human sort of upper uh, torso. And even when I went through, we had what we called the Ivans, you know, named after our Russian counterparts. And they were like these little green guys that were holding weapons like this, and they'd pop up. And you'd shoot a, a pop-up green target. And what they have found, since they've been introducing this, this kind of evolution of target, is that, um, is that in Korea, the, the shooting rate went up to 50%. And Vietnam, it went up to 90 to 95% of all riflemen fired their weapon. And I, and I can speak from my own personal experience that it's almost 100% in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, from the guys I've been around. So there really is something to this, th these little things, these little changes that we've made that actually contribute to these big picture sort of ideas 
Um, and it is an excellent read. I, I recommend anybody checking it out. And there's some other things that he addresses, um, like cadences. Cadences. And I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm kind of highlight one of the cadences we used to see. And this, this, when I grew up in the Army, 2001, this, and this is a product of the 80s. The 80s were an interesting time for the Army. I wish I would have been a soldier in the 80s. I would have had a cool mustache. Uh, it would have been great. But I uh, went out of style after I got in. But, uh, you know, there, there used to be this cadence. It was left, right, left, right, left, right, kill. Left, right, left, right. You know I will. And that's, you, you're running down the street, reading, you know, talking about, singing about killing your enemy. And a part of the reason why, and, and also Grossman addressed this, is dehumanizing this enemy. You, you create, you, you make this, this enemy, like, less than human. It makes it easier to fire. It makes it easier. So, so you, you, put, you sing songs to yourself every morning that you're running down the streets of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, singing about killing the bad guy. You know? It kind of sets you up a little bit. Uh, they talk about, you know, it's, it's the same thing that we talk about when we watch violent movies. You get desensitized to violence. And, uh, but the Army seemed to think that this was really, this kind of behavior was really uh, benefiting them because, you know, hey, our, our fire ratio is going way up. Now, the Army's actually changed this, but we'll address to that. Um, an old, this is the old Cold War era qualification pictures, positions. And when I say qualification, I mean, what we, every year we have to at least fire uh, in a foxhole or something like that. And, or not, I'm sorry, not a foxhole, but we have to qualify. At 40 rounds, we have to hit so many targets, and then we're qualified. And, you know, depending on how, how good you shoot, you get a little badge or a little cool guy uh, title or whatever, right? And uh, when I went in, it was, we had the foxhole. The foxhole, the prone, pr prone unsupported. So I have 20, 20 rounds from the foxhole, 20 rounds from the prone unsupported. The foxhole is a product of, of Cold War fighting, digging into a fo fighting position and shooting standing up. And that, that was the kind of fight we were expecting. We were expecting still Russians to come down, and we were going to be all entrenched in Eastern Europe fighting Russians. And you know, all of us grunts are going to be dug in holes fighting like that. So that was why we qualified for it. And then prone supported was just laying down without any uh, support or anything like that. So that's, that's what it was pre-9-11. Uh, bayonet training, and here's another thing kind of related to the, to the cadences. Uh, what, our little thing is what makes the, the grass grow. And, and this, this is what we'd say as we're you know, using our bayonets. And the drill sergeant would say, what makes the green grass grow? And you say, blood, blood, blood. And as you like stab this target for your bayonet, right? It sounds silly, but uh, man, when, you're, when you're 18 years old and you're on this like testosterone like group, it's like, it's pretty awesome. And you like think that you're like a warrior and all this other stuff, you know? And that's, you know, bayonets have been around for a mighty long time. Uh, when's the last time anybody fixed bayonets in the United States Army and had a fight? Uh, it's been a while. Uh, Civil War, probably. Oh no, maybe World War One. I, I, I give World War One, possibly a couple instances in World War Two. Um, but you know, that's that's a that's a factor. And this is what I was. This is my basic training experience. Um, the fighting positions, uh, foxholes and sweat. Yeah, it relates to the uh, qualification position. The foxhole. We used to dig these foxholes, and that's a good portion of my basic training. Digging holes in the ground so I could, you know, get some place where I could fight in. I don't make my privacy now as a drill sergeant dig any foxholes. That's, that's definitely not occurring, but we'll talk about that. All right, so here's basic, basic training post 9-11. And some of this stuff has changed. And some of the stuff I train on, uh, and some, some of these, um, I haven't been to drill sergeant school in, in a spell, so some of these, in the Army, things are always changing. Training standards are always changing whenever you work in a training environment. So you never know what's going to happen or what new stuff. So back to the qualification thing. They got rid of the foxhole. Nobody's fighting in foxholes anymore. There's not, we're not digging in holes, fighting positions in Iraq, and fighting from that. We're fighting from buildings. We're fighting in the streets. We're fighting from behind cover, uh, behind walls, in, in doorways. And so you had the prone, prone, unsupported, and kneeling position. It was one of these small things, like I said, the little things that have changed. Uh, weapons immersion. Now, privates these days, when I, when I joined the base training, this was really in 2001, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, our weapons were locked into the arms room. I didn't touch the weapon until we went out to the range. And we went out to the range for about two or three days, or two or three weeks, and uh, throughout basic training. And other than that, I didn't have a weapon in my hand. Uh, these days, privates from day three, we issued them out a rifle. And they go everywhere for, for their entire basic training. They have their M16 uh, with them. Whole different ball game. And it's, it's really a product of this, uh, this war. You never know when, and I haven't done, I haven't trained uh, infantrymen by my old home, uh, Fort Benning. I, I've trained down at Fort Sill, and these aren't infantrymen. Some of these are dental hygienists, and they're carrying around basic training with their, you know, M16A4, you know. 
So that's, that's a whole different ball game. And sometimes you gotta be hesitant as a drill sergeant not to make them too mad, because you're like, oh man, this kid, this kid does have a rifle. Probably don't wanna so get too far out of line. But, um, so, and then, okay, so weapons immersion. Convoy live fire. Now this is a military sanctioned drive-by, as we like to joke about. And what this is, this is a direct reflection of these convoys driving throughout Iraq being ambushed. We pretty much throw guys, privates in these trucks, and they point their weapons out the back of the truck, and they drive through it on this, you know, it's like kind of a rough terrain, shooting up targets as they go by, as they're driving. It's essentially a drive-by. It really is, truly is, with M16s. And it's, and it's a pain as a drill sergeant. I'm riding that thing like a Bronco, holding on one of those privates, trying to like get flung out of that dang freaking truck. But uh, it's a... Uh, it's a direct reflection of, of, you know, support. Jessica Lynch, those type of stories from Iraq, uh, support guys who have no business fighting, typically, in, in, in a, you know, on the front lines, they're getting ambushed. Uh, people who traditionally, dental hygienists, are getting ambushed in Iraq on these convoys to another post. So we implemented this in basic training. That's why they know how to fight and, you know, learn some basic sort of uh, skills. Uh, you got MOUT, which stands for Military Operations and Urban Training. Now, this has really started getting some Black Hawk Down sort of uh, era of the military, Mogadishu, and when urban fighting has kind of come back. Uh, in the 80s, we were a lot more of a Eastern European, like, woodland sort of uh, fight, and then MOUT has really come up. And that's what the majority of the fighting is in urban terrain in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, Afghanistan, scratch that. Afghanistan, not as much. It's a little bit different. It's more at the village level whenever you're going into stuff, but I guess it maybe kind of blow up a little bit. But we, I spent two weeks on Mount at the most. No, I'd say two days at the most, uh, pre pre 9/11, and now we we do it all the time. Um, the warrior wearing the black beret. Now the army even says now, now that we have this this front or lack of uh, everybody. The army army's kind of I think the army kind of copied the Marine Corps on this. The Marine Corps used to say everybody's a rifleman in the Marine Corps. In the army, we say everybody's a warrior. Now, I, I strongly disagree with this, but uh, you know, the dental hygienist isn't quite the warrior. Right? But um, you know, nothing against them. I need my teeth uh, in good shape as well. But um, you know, we, we kind of transition from this. We want to feel like the army. I'm not allowed. Technically, I'm, I, they, they don't want me as a drill sergeant to say call them anything other than Private Joe or Private uh, whoever or a warrior. A lot different from where I went in. They call me any name in the book. Uh, I've heard all sorts of cool stuff that they ought to be. And it's sometimes hard not to laugh at the creative stuff that they can put me down with. Uh, but it's a different army. It's a different generation of soldier. And uh, we want to instill some confidence in, in soldiers. So calling people warrior and, and, and the wearing, the issuing of the Black Ray, which happened actually was started in the works before 9 11, I think about 2000. Uh, it used to be the Ranger Battalion's headgear. And then they, um, General Shinseki, decided that he wanted the whole entire army to wear this distinguished black beret, and the Rangers were really upset about that, I don't blame them. But, um, but you know, it's kind of this making everybody feel kind of important sort of thing. Uh, you know, we, kind of, we kind of make jokes about, you know, uh, everybody gets an award, sort of like everybody wins at sports, and everybody gets a trophy. I kind of think it's kind of like that, but, uh, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just an infantry guy, so I don't know. But um, medical training, uh, third stick of the charm, when I went through, Medical training was, hey, here, put a bandage on this. Now, they've changed this again, but the last major cycle I did with privates, they were actually sticking, uh, you know, getting an IV stick on somebody, and that was unheard of. We never, I never would have trusted myself uh, doing that back in the day. But, hey, that's, that's a thing. Uh, whale sounds. Whale sounds sounds funny, and this is a new bit of information I got from uh, my wife. She, she's also a... Um, she, she went to drill sergeant school and they have a new, she has the latest updated information on some of the things that they're doing with privates. Apparently, I call it whale sounds, not officially called whale sounds. She describes that as some kind of Inya type music that they play to the privates. They get them in this, this mood to like, I don't know, to focus and they envision themselves shooting the day before. And, and they, I don't know, I don't know what it is. They say it works though, that's the weird thing. So who knows, I'll be playing Inya, jamming out to it or whale sounds, or a rain beating when they go to sleep to put them at ease so they can form well. But it's having real effects, so different, I don't know, the men who stare at goats sort of thing. Um, but uh, physical readiness training uh, is PRT. It's a high-speed program, well, not the program, uh, that the Army has put in a lot, a lot of money and to get soldiers physically fit. We spend a lot of money in the, in the military 
uh, fixing or, or paying for injuries that soldiers occur during, incur during training and pe physical training and all that other stuff. And they have some funny, silly stuff called the high jumper. Uh, you look at them, you've been in the Army a couple days, you learn the high jumper, and you're like, you want me to do that? That looks ridiculous. But they put a lot of research and money into this, and um, they believe in it. So uh, it's, it's a different change from whatever pre-9-11, they just beat you down. You just do your standard stuff, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, long road marches. Uh, but the Army's getting a little bit smarter, incorporating a lot of yoga-type exercises. It, it's interesting. And then back to the bayonets, say they so, as Weezer would say. Um, bayonets, I, I am pretty sure that we're phasing out bayonets. Uh, unfortunately, I never, I left my bayonet in the arms room in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was probably rusty. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's good warrior type training, but it's not really that necessary. I don't, I don't mind if it goes away, but. All right, the smartest generation. I've been told you guys are the smartest generation. And I've told I don't belong to that generation, which makes me kind of upset. I'm not that old yet. But uh, it truly is a different generation these days. Technology is way more your guys' thing than, than us. We're, we're still, like I said, look at my PowerPoint. You guys would have something that was, you know, links to YouTube, you know, Facebook. People would be, like, streaming this right now. And, you know, this, and that's where the Army technology is going. So, so you guys really are. Um, going to be very gifted with this new technology we're going to have as soldiers. And we're, there's a lot of, a lot of these small things are because of, that's the way, type of, uh, type of, type of people that you guys have become and what your, what your generation is going to be. Um, Non-combatants, when I went through, we didn't really focus about that too much. Uh, but now it's a very big thing. Target discrimination, uh, COB stands for civilians on the battlefield. When you're going through, and it's a product of this asymmetrical warfare, when you have people who don't have uniforms, um, you know, who do you distinguish? That's a very important thing is to tell who is who and who's, uh, who you need to not pull the trigger on. So we, we really uh, beat that into people's training now. Cultural sensitivity, we actually teach, um, you know, we have a lot, like, I don't know, they're pretty standard, like, you know, history about Islam or, or certain things about the culture, uh, that region, and, and historical facts about Iraq and Afghanistan. We'll, we'll go over certain things like that. So. Uh, learn a couple of Arabic words here and there. Um, training sites, how do you convert a trench into a cave? You add plywood. Um, when I was at Fort Bragg, right, right after 9-11 happened, we were going through trench warfare. We were going through these trench training courses. And they're like, hey, we're going to be fighting in caves. How do we transition? Oh, so plywood. So a trench became a cave. So you know, that's, that's how we adapt. And then we have the Fobbits, the Fobbits of the Shire. Um, a FOB is forward operating base, and pretty much the FOB, we even trained this in basic training now. It's basically, it's just a, uh, a little mini base that have tents and people stay in them, and we actually replicate that to get them the feeling of what this gonna, life's going to be like in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're going to be living on these, and I call them FOBs. We, we call them FOBs because they never leave the FOB to go fight the war, is what we like to say, but, uh, so we call them FOBs. But, uh, you know, that's one of the little changes that we have seen. All right. I'm running a little bit on, on, I guess I've been a little overwinded on some things, so imagine that. Uh, but this is, this is, we're getting to the end here. Now this is where I personally think I met post 9-11 and pre-9-11 kind of came together in one sort of fight. And I, it's Fallujah, and it happened in, in November uh, 2004. And it was, um, it was in the city of Fallujah, which is west, due west of Baghdad. Uh, the Marine Corps had, had pretty much seized uh, all Fallujah, and they had given them warning. They said, hey, look, uh, I think Zalkawi, or what's that? I don't remember what his name is. The number two uh, for, for the al-Qaeda at the time. Uh, he was supposed to be holed up in there. They gave him like two or three weeks or months or something like that for them to evacuate all the civilians out of this you know, pretty significant sized city. And so that had to happen, but then it was, so, so in the city was supposed to be nothing but fighters, guys who just wanted to mix it up with us. So we had a whole city of guys who just wanted to fight. So the Marine Corps had uh, seized it, and they were kind of doing some old school seize and fainting maneuvers. And uh, they called up the Army, they wanted us to help them out, so there were two battalions of Army came over there, and they called 2-2 Infantry, which is who I was with. And so, hey, we were like, hey, yeah, why not? Yeah, no better else going on. So the Marine Corps is fainting, and this, this is old school sort of technology, this is Cold War sort of tactics. They started acting and pretending like they were, for months, they were pretending like they were going to come through the south of the city. Well, it turned out, you know, they were, they were bluffing, and we 
we came around the north, and so the uh, insurgency and the insurgents had built up all sorts of elaborate defenses in the south of the city, ready for us to come through there. And we would have lost a lot more people if we would have came through the south of the city, because uh, we started finding those on our way back north going down. We started like, wow, they would have, they would have messed us up. Um, but they did have their minefield, right? A breaching a mine, and minefields old school. I mean, that's since like World War One, we've been dealing with minefields, right? And never really had the IEDs are a different sort of uh, animal than a minefield. And so we we got to do the classic like old Cold, cold War skill of shooting this little thing over and blowing up all the mines and driving through. We just amazing little breach that was like textbook breach. I think they're te I think they were teaching this uh, in the Pentagon of our unit doing this breach. It was, it was really a big deal for how the battlefield meets the textbook sort of thing. Um, well, we did that, so, so that was very classic big army, old school fight. And then we did this house to house sort of thing where you know, we had a couple squads of, of guys. It was, we had, I think in my unit, we had two companies and they weren't even full companies. So you figure about, yeah, probably about 60, 60 guys. Uh, in my platoon, we had two squads of, and I, I was young squad leader at the time, and so we pretty much the Bradley used to fight, and then we'd jump out, and then we'd go fight and you know, take houses and, and clear those. And so that was, a, that was a unique sort of thing. And so we were fighting against these two to three man little fighting groups of these little Hitman um, RPG squads and whatnot, finding all sorts of elaborate traps and whatnot. But uh, we, we got them pretty good. Uh, AC 130s. The AC 130s, that plane just flies around uh, in circles, and it has like an artillery piece on it. And you can actually see the laser with your night vision. You can see the laser coming down and him just messing stuff up. It is a pretty, I think I saw everything the, the military has to offer in that one fight except for naval gunfire, which we don't really have anymore. So uh, uh, they used white phosphorus, which was kind of a big deal. Um, they were kind of hesitant to admit that they used white phosphorus. F-18s, I thought it was going to get blown up by an F-18 one time. They came dogging down, was on our rooftop, and I thought it was going to blow me up. But luckily it went like two blocks down and blew the crap out of them. Uh, a giant bulldozers with chicken wire armor. Man, that was a sight. This Marine Corps dude, we were fighting next side side by side. Uh, you know, I mean, Marine Corps, you know, everybody thinks they're high speed, but they're just the same as we are with worse equipment. Um, but they had this one joker who was driving a bulldozer. He had just chicken wire around his cockpit of his bulldozer just ramming bad guy houses. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> they were shooting at him for RPGs and everything. I was like, man, I've seen everything in the Army in this fight, or Marine Corps, a giant bulldozer. If they would have had Truckosaurus, that thing at those race car events that eats cars, that would have been... I would just died right then, then happy man. Uh, and then there's a difference between the professional fighters that I kind of uh, you know, talked about a little bit before. Uh, the IED command sites, they, they'd have a building, a house, and you just see all these wires and like labels on like this is where this road, and they're, they're ready for us, and they, they would have got us pretty good. Uh, we found this one anti-aircraft gun. An anti-aircraft gun is, sometimes you'll see these quad 50 cal machine guns, and they're used to shoot into the air and knock down an airplane. Well, they had them behind gates ready to go down roads for us that they would just smoke us. Like there's nothing you can do about that. They would open up the gate and just let loose. So that was what they were dealing with this uh, waiting for us on the south side. And then, um, so we have the, we mostly come at night, mostly sort of, if anybody has ever seen the movie Aliens, I would recognize that phrase. But uh, we, the, the US Army, we, we have, and the military in general, we, we really do own the night. We have all these cool guy lasers, night vision. And I can put a laser on somebody and they don't even know it's on them. You know, I can see them. Uh, so they typically didn't want to fight with us at night, but they'd fight with us during the day. But they wouldn't fight with us at night because they knew that they were they're in bad shape. I did find out, was, I used to have this, uh, this beacon, infrared beacon, that you could only see if, with night vision on it. It used to be on the top of my head. I thought, I thought it was cool. I used it, I thought the Marine Corps didn't shoot me. Because uh, I could see them over there, and they got a little itchy sometimes. They saw me up top of it. I'm a tall guy. But I don't want to, hey, hey guys, hey, see that little flashing light? That means I'm a good guy. Well, I found out later on that some of these insurgents what, what we think were the professionals had night vision. And we never knew that. We never suspected it. So I had this beacon on my head going for everybody. Hey, anybody want to take a shot at me? Hey, I'm open game, you know? I kind of thought kind of differently after that. So um, long story short, Fallujah really was this mix for me. All sorts of traditional fighting. I mean, we had a tank beside us, and he was, that was when I ran behind a tank and almost soiled myself when it, when it fired. Um, all sorts of fun stuff in that fight. And all sorts of... Um, yeah, like I said, tradition meets sort of this new brand of warfare. All right, so to wrap this up, um, a sustainable balance, right? How do we keep a flexible force to meet the future threats, both conventional and unconventional? 
uh, is the uh, Global War Against Terror Army up to the task of, of a North Korea or, or, or an Iran. Um, and I think North Korea is going to have a very conventional army. They're going to be a very Cold War fight. Uh, that's, that's how I see it. Have we tra transitioned too much over to this fighting insurgency warfare? Or have we, you know, fighting these small five to ten man groups? Or are we going to have, again, you know, divisions of tank warfare meeting out in the plains of, or, I don't know, whatever, whatever terrain of Korea, mixing it up? Um, that's something that they're dealing with at a higher level, deciding with, and, and it has ramifications. Nothing in the Army is, you know, you look at our, our, our coolest, best uh, fighter planes, like the F-22 that we don't even, kind of don't even need right now, unless North Korea, but they were developing that probably in the late 80s, in its, or, or 90s at least. It takes a long time for this, like, especially new technology for the Army to kick in. Um, you know, it's, how do, you, how do you foresee what's going to happen, the next threat in 10, 15 years? How do you design technology that can meet those obligations in 10 to 15 years? So that, that's a task for people who get paid way more than me. Um, you know, hey, if they gave me cool guy toys, I'll, I'll try to use them to the best of my ability. But um, the future soldier, uh, who, who knows what it is. Mean, it could, is it going to be Van Damme uh, from, from Time, or what was that movie? Where, Universal Soldier? I don't know. Maybe. You guys, anybody ever seen Universal Soldier? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am old. But, uh, yeah, the, the future soldier's going to be interesting. I, I think we're moving to a more educated group, um, technology uh, savvy. But, um, oh, who's, who's that going to make up? I don't know. But that's something, that's something the Army's really put a lot of time and effort in trying to see how, how to fit their plan around them, around you guys, or you know, your kids or whoever, so. All right, so I don't have much time. I think I might have went over, possibly. Uh,